This podcast is made for fun and is not subsidized. Hi everyone, welcome to Orinda Talks Fantasy on Sci-Fi. I'm your host Orinda and today we're talking about Star Trek Las Vegas with Roy Sayers. Star Trek Las Vegas is one of the largest Star Trek conventions in the world. I know it's a few days you found all about Star Trek. Actors will be there doing panels. You can take a picture with them and ask for an autograph. Of course there also will be announcements for the future of Star Trek. Star Trek Las Vegas of STLV for short is still one of the events that on my bucket list. I always follow STLV on social media and what I see is very awesome. One of the things I love is the merchandise stands but also the cosplay. I cosplay myself and every time I put a Star Trek uniform on I got some kind of a pride feeling. It's also awesome to meet the actors and people behind the scenes. And I know for a fact that you will meet a lot of like-minded people as well in the Star Trek world itself, but also as in the fans. In fact, what I like to say is just the whole Star Trek community. The Star Trek community is awesome. Our guest today is Roy Sayers. He has a lot for satisfied. Hello Roy, and thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. Great! Um. I noticed that you have uh, going to the Star Trek Las Vegas event. I did, yes. And was this your first time, or? No, this is actually my third time. Um, oh, nice. My, yeah, my my wife and I. Well, actually, we were not husband and wife yet. We were still dating, but we went in 2012, and then we went back in 2019, which is when we decided hey, we're going to start doing this every year. And then, of course, 2020 has something to say about that. But <laughs> um, so, but it's back this year, and, yeah, we were able to make it out. So, yeah, third time, and, uh, yes, yeah, kind of seeing how it was before and after COVID was, it was interesting. So, uh, Was it totally different before COVID, or? So, yes and no. I mean, it was you know the events and everything like they still had it was still mostly the same event uh there were a lot of guests that couldn't make it mm. uh nana visitor uh oh, i'm sorry no not nana she didn't make it but jerry ryan specifically she was working on picard uh because the production had run late because of covid and all that so there that all got pushed out and so many actors who are working on picard could not make it just because they were still in the middle of filming and as part of like jerry taylor uh, seven of nine yeah i think it was like in her it was part of the safety protocol for filming that basically nobody who's you know filming right now is allowed mm. to travel so there were quite a few people who couldn't come because of work and some who just couldn't come because you know they were worried about the risk uh, but it was still a really good um there was a really good turnout there were quite a few celebrities you know whether they be writers actors producers um you know there was even an astronaut there um so there there was quite a few people and yeah i wouldn't say it was worse um it was just different uh how long does this event normally is because i know it's a quite a large event for like a star trek event so yeah, it really is. So this year it ran from August 11th to the 15th. Uh, so I guess four or five days. Um, we got there a day early. We were there on the Tuesday, I guess the 10th. Um, and because we had the gold level tickets, we were actually able to see a couple things early, but they were still basically setting it up. So it really wasn't um, kind of a huge preview. We, we kind of saw everything with everybody else, you know, when it officially opened. Uh, but yeah, it, it's actually very good that the event is so long because there's panels running all day, whether mm-hmm. you know it'll be actors from a particular show or somebody they had a sound designer who did you know sound effects talking about you know that particular art. 
they have all sorts of people involved in the production doing different shows and you kind of want to see everything so it's nice that they have that it does last so long because you can go to the, all the panels you want and still have plenty of time to go you know get your autographs your photos or you know spend all your money in the vendor area <laughs> yeah tell me about that because i always uh I follow SLV on, for example, on Twitter and all the other social media. So uh, most of the times I uh, see those pictures of the uh, merchandise, etc. How do I have to uh, see, uh, can you sketch a uh, map, how it looks like, how in that way, how large it is? Yeah, absolutely. So it's... Find the convention center size. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, it's huge. I've been to several different sci-fi and fantasy conventions, smaller ones. Um, and as far as having a just a con like a, a vendor area, it's pretty massive. There are some I've seen that have bigger vendor areas, but then like, we have a comic convention here locally in Austin, Texas, every year. And it has a larger area, but the photo ops, um, the panels, everything happens kind of in one giant convention hall. Whereas STLV has there's Several. one hall, yeah, there's one hallway just for vendors, one huge theater just for like the main stage. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of broken up. So it's a little, it's not really an apples to apples comparison with vendor area size. Um, and this year it was a little smaller again, you know, it was a slightly reduced turnout, but it's a good mix of people selling either new items, you know, some are handcrafted. They, there was a vendor there selling like these beautifully uh, crafted uh, handbags with various Star Trek characters painted on them. There's, you know, vintage stuff. You could get Happy Meal boxes from the 80s if you wanted. So you can kind of find every little niche of memorabilia. But mixed in there are the guest stars. So, you know, Anthony Rapp, uh, Chirac Lofton, uh, Robert O'Reilly, just a few who had their own tables just set up in the vendor area. So you could go up and chat with them, buy an autograph directly from them, or, you know, if they were selling books or CDs, you could buy directly from them. So that was also kind of cool that as you're walking around, you also see, you know, actors and things kind of mingling with everyone which is kind of adds to the atmosphere i think yeah I, um well we in uh, the uk have the uh, destination star trek and it's a similar thing only much much smaller but um i do really like it that when uh, actors are just yeah just sitting there you can uh, get an autograph and just make a small talk with them and etc so um Let's talk about what kind of an atmosphere is there. Ooh, that's a good one. You know, it's it's a little hard to take in. Um, you know, there's not many places you can walk around in a Starfleet uniform and nobody looks at you weird. So I that, yeah. Yeah, so as I'm walking around and like I'm not only not standing out, it's you know, it, it's basically It's one big family. More. It's in basically one big family. I noticed from the whole Star Trek, Trek community, we are one big family. And if you are a cosplay or not, and some of the cosplay are very good. Oh, very some of them are good. fantastic. Yeah. Uh, mine were very simple. I had just simple Starfleet uniforms. But, you know, and I think you mentioned family, and that's something I took away from this convention more than I ever have. I don't know. That was for personal reasons it kind of affected me a little differently this year uh that i won't necessarily get into but yeah i was definitely left with that sense of wow this really is a family um at one point my wife and i were talking to Chirac lofton uh jake cisco as i'm sure everybody knows mm. at, at his booth and i mean he, the guy could not have been nicer he was just uh, he was just happy to see everybody he was uh very very warm and welcoming and so we're chatting with him for a while. There was nobody around, so we kind of had a, a nice, unique opportunity to kind of chat and not, you know, worry about time. And so we talked about Aaron Eisenberg, of course, who played Nog, mm. uh, who passed away mm. uh, just a couple of years ago. And they were really great friends in real life. They ran the Seventh Rule podcast together. 
Um, and so he he spoke about that to us on a very personal level, and that's it. I thought it was weird at first, and in my my inner monologue, I'm like, oh, he's talking to us like he was talking to a family member, mm-hmm. and that's kind of when it clicked that in his mind he was, and that we you know everybody. I kept hearing we're all big one family, but it wasn't until that moment that it really it kind of slapped me in the face that yeah we are one big family, and that that was something I felt overwhelmingly the entire trip. It was just a wonderful group of people treating everybody there wonderfully. And that is what my experience just is because um, I am haven't been long doing cosplay or going to events like this, but every time I walk around there is nobody is judging you on what cosplay you have on or whatever it's none of the ten times it's all pos- positive not yes. only from the actors but also uh also from yeah the whole fandom and all the fans and etc and um my first star trek cosplay was a, a steampunk version of dr crusher oh nice and um I met Gates McFadden at that, uh, my first uh, Destiny Star Trek in Birmingham. And I went to her uh, table and she signed uh, some of the things I had. And we started talking and she loved my outfit. And then I said, well, my why I love Dr. Crush is because she's also schooled in the old traditional medicine. And I am also schooled in an old tradition in medicine and so we start talking about that and it was very nice and talking about Gates McFadden have you ever heard her podcast uh her podcast no I don't believe I have I will send you the link it's very nice it's uh she has a very good upset about it and uh she's talking only with her uh, Star Trek family so she okay. interviews every time uh, from Jonathan Frakes to, uh, well, next episode will be with uh, Denise Cosby. So oh, uh, it's really, really nice. And you, uh, you get to know the actors a little bit more. The one I really, really love was uh, with Will Wheaton, but also with Michael Dorn. And I must say, I have even more admiration for Michael Dorn right now, how he is and how, how nice he really is. So. I will send you the link, okay, so yeah, you can like listen that. to that. But uh, yeah, I, I always have, I always could be myself when I went to an event like that. And the funny part was, I uh, there was on also on Destination Star Trek, um, there was some of security guys there who uh, saw my outfit and. They kind of salute me and say, well, Doc, uh, I got pain in this and that, and can you help me? <laughs> so that was very funny. And nice. Yeah, it's, it's like I said, it's 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 not being crushy about one big family, but you can be yourself. And That's very true, yes. And I think as a nerd or geek-wise person, it's so nice you can be yourself and not being judged you being a geek or a nerd yeah i agree that was something i also noted so this was my very first time doing cosplay at all and so of course i'm you know i was putting my comm badge on using you know a ruler comparing it to pictures on the screen and trying to get everything perfect Mm -hmm. and i was really worried like i had some little details off i had um, I did a, I made my own com badge for my lower decks uniform mm-hmm. and uh, I had a paint chip that I was very self-conscious about and the, the, I just got nothing but compliments from people. I had people coming after me like, oh, that, that looks great. Where did you get that? How did you do this? How did you do that? It was, like you said, it was all positive. Everybody who spoke to me was either complimenting me or asking how I did something. And as somebody who's doing this for the first time, that was really, really cool. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I have the same um, experience with that. My very first cosplay was a like a herb lady. Uh, in the old days, like uh, the 15th and 16th century. And I went to Elvia, that's one uh, of the uh, 
uh, fantasy and medieval events in the Netherlands. I am originally for, from the Netherlands, so I went there and that was my first cosplay. And I had this little, little basket with all herbs in it. And on the basket, I also wrote free hugs. And <laughs> I don't know, have you heard about Outlander? The oh, series? yeah. Well, I am the person like Claire, Claire Frazier. Okay. And we had a, uh, on that event, they had a Sassanach camp. And there was someone who played the herb lady, etc., etc. And they had some errors on it. So I uh, told her, well, this and this and this is wrong, that you have to do. And that's, and so there was a, I, after that, I got a lot of people who are coming to me from, oh, well, I have. Uh, for example, a headache, and I can't. I have a chronic headache, and they give me this and that, and I don't like it, and it doesn't work. What can I use as like a herb wise, you know? So, I got a lot of positive feedback of on the cosplay, but also, like I said, you can be yourself. Yeah, you're sort of using that that herbal healing knowledge as part of your cosplay. That's really cool. But also, I mean, if you go into a Star Trek event, it's just, yeah, it's not the, the, the smushy way of big family, but everything is accepting you as who you are and what you are wearing and that you also are a fan, etc., etc. Right, absolutely. No, I, I agree completely. And I, and I love that everybody seems to get it. I mean, you know, there's there's some bad apples in the group, of course. There's some people Of course, who... there's always. <laughs> There's somehow people who are fans and just don't get it, which I don't understand, but those those people were so rare. So, um, the event is for a five days. Um, can you tell me something, a little bit of the schedule? Because um, I, oh, sorry, one f other point about the cosplay. I don't know if you know her, but she has a very, very good cosplay. In a heart, but her name is uh, at Sound of Cosplay, and she, uh, she, they invite her in every big event there is. She does a very good um, Stamets cosplay, and she oh, is no. almost. She is almost identical in in a Stamets. Look her up on Twitter. She is on there. She is very good. She also does uh, last of a, in 2019. She did a Laurel cosplay. Wow, Ooh. that was so good. But she is good. She is so good. It is. It's 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 you. I always say she would be the younger version of Stamets. Oh wow! So is a uh, sound of cosplay. Sound of cosplay, yeah. Oh and... wow! You were you were right. That is Stamets. That's really good. Yeah, she is good, and and uh, even Anthony Rep uh, said always, "Oh, that's my twin brother." <laughs> that's great. So um, well, back to STLV. So. Um, I know there are some uh, sketches like uh, every year, like uh, karaoke, a disco, um, what's the other one? Well, a lot of things they do. Um, right. What do you uh, do? You go to those or have you experienced them? So for like the dance party stuff, um, like the you know they did karaoke so the karaoke actually got canceled this year um and they ended up changing it to bingo i believe yeah uh, we were going to go look at it uh but that particular night i believe was the uh ben vereen concert and so we were a little too tired to go to that afterwards so mm. we um you know we're, we're kind of at that age we're around nine or ten at night we're we're basically passed out so yeah um you know, some of the later stuff we end up missing. Uh, but, you know, the nice thing is we're there bright and early in the morning. So, um, but yeah, as far as the site, you know, we didn't, 
I, I mostly went to panels this year, um, you know, and then mm. a couple like mu music shows and then yeah. some of the they did, you know, f group photos for some of the cosplay groups. So I did a lot of that. Um, but as far as, you know, the daily schedule goes, it was I mean, it was pretty packed. They generally started around 10 or 11 in the morning. It would be something in the main stage. And then the other side stages would have would start doing stuff maybe a half hour later. And then they were pretty much just packed all day until around six or seven at night when most mm -hmm. things would close down. But then the later events happening kind of in the bar area, those would still keep going on. Okay, yeah. Did the uh, Ratback uh, perform this year? Yes, that was the very, very last thing. It was Sunday night after I everything had closed. Yeah, they did the... And that was my first time seeing them. Um, oh, nice. Oh, it was so much fun. I knew about them because the... What was the name of the documentary? What We Leave Behind? Yeah. The yeah. DS... So they, they were in that documentary, and I saw that. And so I knew yeah. about them just from that. But yeah, seeing them live, uh, that was a real treat. I did not know how much fun that was going to be. Yeah, I always loved them too. I always, uh, also saw that documentary. And especially, um, what's his name, who played Rom. When he did the in, uh, intro song with um, Quark, that was so funny. And oh, uh, yeah. It was so funny. The lyrics, I was thinking, oh my god, I need to record this. This, this is so cool. And those lyrics, it's amazing. Yeah, and uh, Rom, Max Grotichek, he wrote mo almost all of those songs too. Um, yeah. No matter who's performing it. But yeah, they were... Yeah, some of the song it was just kind of blew me away with how good the parodies were. Yeah. Um, I mean, they could have gotten, you know, they could have put a lot less work into it, I think, have been just as funny. But no, they, they took it to the next level. Yeah, and I think uh, they have known each other for so long. And I think also that they are uh, being a band together. That's why they call themselves a Rat Pack as well. But right. Yeah, I really love them. I really love them. It, and yeah, they are it was, so it was good. a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, they were really talented. It was really good music, uh, aside from, you know, the funny lyrics and all the shows and jokes. But, and then when you add all that in, it was just, I mean, it was really, really a great experience. I mean, it was probably the perfect thing to end the, end the week on. Yeah. Has there been a little bit more announcements of uh, the Voyager documentary this year? So there was some panel that was discussing it. Uh, embarrassingly, I did not go to that, but mm -hmm. um, I actually, I would have to dig through it. I think I deleted its archive, but I actually, uh, I donated to the Kickstarter. So I've been getting updates through that. Um, mm -hmm. I think they're getting pretty close because I had to finalize some of my details last week for whatever items I'm receiving. Um, so I feel like they're getting close, but I yeah, I don't know exactly. Um, from what I saw, though, the only thing that really leaked uh, was Robert Beltran. He sort of halfway leaked that he will be working on Prodigy um, yeah. with... Um, Kate Mulgrew. With Kate Mulgrew, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so he'll be working on that. So that was sort of news uh, that I don't think was official until he said it. Mm. Uh, but as far as that goes, I think that's the only thing I personally got. But, you know, there were there were so many panels, only so many I could go to. So, uh, Was there a panel that you really liked and uh, that you really want to go to there? Which one was it? So the one that... As soon as I saw the schedule, it was like, okay, no matter what else was going on, I have to go to that. It was uh, Mario Runko Jr. He was a NASA astronaut, mm. um, and that's that was more of a personal thing. I've I've been really into the space program since I was really really young, so um, that's something I geek out on a lot. Uh, and I met him afterwards, and. 
I don't really get starstruck. I basically, you know, I, you know, we're all just people. Some people can act. Some, you know, I write software. You know, we all do our thing. But when I met a real life astronaut, I, I forgot how to talk. I, it was just bad. I, I turned into an eight year old boy again. So, uh, that one was really, really cool. Um, but as far as actual. I, all the panels are fun. They always get a few actors from each show together and kind of talk about things. But, you know, having been to this is my third one and then going to other conventions where Trek actors show up, you know, you hear a lot of the same mm -hmm, information, mm -hmm. a lot of the same stories. So one thing that was super, super cool that I, I didn't expect it to be this fun was the Discovery D&D &D night um, where. Oh, I heard a, about that. Yeah. Yeah, so it was uh, Blue Del Barrio, Mary Wiseman, Mary Chifo, um, Anthony Rapp. Anthony Rapp, and then the DM was. I forget his name. It's Mary Wiseman's husband, though. And I think mm, he had a. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. Uh, so he was the DM, and it was so good. Uh, you could. Uh, I think Mary Chifo was. It was her first time playing D and D, but everybody else was clearly very, very comfortable with it. Mm. Uh, and with them all being like, you know, really talented actors, they were voice acting their characters really well. <laughs> um, and it was just no surprise. Was... I'm sorry, God. No surprise. Oh, it was no surprise, but yeah, Mary Wiseman especially, she kind of stole the show. She was a goblin, and oh, just, dear. she did this goblin voice so well, and just, she could just interject these funny little one-liners so well. Um, she was, it was just far and away, she was the star of Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, but they were, I mean, they were all just fantastic. Nice. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the other panels. Yeah, there were... You know, and the musical acts, uh, not really the panels, the musical acts are actually something really special. You know, Ben Vereen, who was uh, LaForge's father in one episode, mm. he was there and, um, you know, he did a musical act and sort of talked about his connection with Star Trek. Um, and apparently it was because he had worked with um, LeVar Burton on Roots that basically once LeVar was involved in Star Trek, he kind of wanted to get Ben pulled into that. Um, and so that's how he ended up on Star Trek TNG and became part of the whole family. But yeah, even though he only had, you know, a, a, a guest spot on one episode, he really, really plays up his, his, his uh, association with it he loves the fact that he was on star trek he loves everything about it he has his like original jacket they gave him when he was a guest star yeah. and he wears to the convention yeah so he was it was really cool and you know he's more of a traditional kind of song and dance man from a kind of an older era oh and so it was yeah interesting to see that yeah and, i love you know, and those my, musicals I, absolutely yeah and my my wife she's a huge musical fan and so um now, I'll say the Ben Vereen show was the reason we upgraded from Captain's Chair to Gold Seats this year, mm. uh, was just to see that show. So, how many fans did you meet that you didn't know or did know before uh, Oh, fans? Oh, lots. Um, I didn't know anyone there aside from the people I traveled with. Um, it was me and my wife, and then another couple that i've known for a lot of years um i've known a friend i've known since high school he and his wife went as well um and so aside from those guys uh everyone else i met there i was meeting for the first time um and yeah and i'm pretty shy have you know anxiety for this that and the other mm. and you know so so being social is always a challenge for me and I think it speaks to the whole family atmosphere that I was just going up and talking to people and I had so many great little conversations with people. And, you know, after, you know, being a shy introvert and going through a pandemic where I couldn't talk to anybody really for a year anyhow, um, it was kind of weird. Like I was just very out of practice and talking to people and it, it could not have been a better place to kind of get comfortable with people again. So, yeah, all this, you know, I don't know, maybe, a, you know, 50, 100 just little conversations in elevators, waiting in line, sitting at Starbucks, you know, 
you just strike up little conversations with people, and it's it's really one of the more beautiful aspects of the convention to me. Well, I think it's uh, what the most beautiful thing about that is is that you are with like-minded people. Right. And I am also an introvert, so I know what you're talking about. And um, but I always notice, like I said before you can be totally yourself nobody is judging you you are yeah. in a positive uh environment and in a positive vibe and everyone loves star trek and love the same things and um i think that is a great help of it too yes absolutely um, you know, and, and aside from just loving a sci-fi show, you know, Star Trek represents so much more. You know, it does yes. represent acceptance and, you know, diversity and moving forward together. And so people at the convention generally share those values, too. And yes. so you kind of you kind of know that you're any conversation you go into, it's going to be with a, a nice, kind, open minded person. And so that just yeah, makes everything so much easier. Yeah, indeed. And, um, yeah, what I also really love, the actors are actually really nice. And um, there was f one part when I went to uh, Destination Star Trek, uh, when I told you about the uh, steampunk version of Dr. Crusher, I was um, by a stand that was selling um, tribbles. And I didn't notice that somebody was uh, standing behind me, and it was the um, actor who played um, Gowron. Gowron? Oh, Robert O'Reilly, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 uh, the other one. Uh... Oh, Martok? Yeah, Martok, yeah. Okay, but... I can't remember his name, but uh... he, yeah, he was there too. Yeah, he, he was standing behind me, but he was in... Um costume Be oh, okay. because he did just did a uh, random of pictures that people could uh, take pictures with him on the Klingon bridge oh very and cool and I was looking up at him and said oh I, I greeted him etc and he said uh, to me you're looking very cool you could be uh, it would be a, a, a great or surprising thing if they made some kind of a steampunk version uh, parody on of star trek about it especially with the klingons with you know it's like yeah that's, oh yeah that's, so it was very um because i always have loved martok and um he is one of my favorite general klingon generals so uh that he oh, was yeah, actually he's so good uh, that he was really talking to me. I was thinking, okay, good, great, <laughs> shy. <laughs> and uh, uh, JG Hertzler, that's yeah, his name. That's um, his name, yeah. Yeah, he was. There was a Klingon panel that he was part of uh, at, at STLV, and he was great. He was wearing cargo shorts, a t shirt. He had a huge white beard, sunglasses, and a pirate mm -hmm. hat the entire time. <laughs> I think that is I, a t I, s typical him to do something like that. Yeah, it, after seeing him on stage and hearing him talk, um, I, you know, because I didn't know much about the actor before that, and I was like, oh, okay, that he's uh, he's a little out there. He's kind of a character, but yeah, again, he's super nice. Um, I, you know, I saw him interacting with other fans, and yeah, he could not have been nicer. Um, yeah, that happened to a friend of mine. She was, so she was more of a next gen fan and not super familiar with the movies, you mm. know, and probably probably not at the same level as somebody like you and I would be. But she was saying some. She's like, oh, this lady walked by, and she just had the nicest things to say about my outfit. And later on, we're walking around, she's like, oh, there's that lady that was so nice to me. It was Robin Curtis, Lieutenant Savick. Oh. Uh, and I was like, oh, my God, you have any idea who was talking to you? She's like, no. And I was like, you know, Savick from Star Trek Three. She's like, yeah. I'm like, that was her. She's like, oh, my God. Um, uh, she kind of it kind of short circuited her because it was like hours before. And then she realized, like, she she was supposed to have freaked out and didn't. Um, but um, 
Yeah, and Robin Curtis specifically was actually really, really noteworthy because she was not really there as a celebrity. She was kind of just in the crowd the whole time. I mean, I think she did some photo ops and whatnot, but I just saw her in the crowd the whole time. And I, at one point I was waiting in line right in front of her and she just turned around and made like a random joke to me, a random, you know, kind of just joking comment about the line and just like she was anybody else. And I'm like, wow, you're like Star Trek celebrity your Star Trek royalty to sing here talking to me, which, you know, obviously is normal. As a fan, it was super special. Yeah, and, well, I think what fans sometimes forget, and I have seen that multiple times, that uh, the fans um, think that the actor is also the same like their characters. Yes. And... Yes. The other thing is they are just people as well. They need sleep, they need to eat and go to the toilet. So right. why are we giving them a stardom like they are above us? If I can say it like that. So um, the first time I met a Star Trek celebrity, I was also flabbergasted because I had no idea how I had to react on it yeah but um he was very nice he was um i went with uh, david schultz that Gosh. was the first um uh, murdoch from the a-team and um uh, barkley oh, right oh right 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 yeah, yeah, yeah okay so he was my very first star trek celebrity i ever met and he was so nice. He was so sweet. And I also had my, that was also the first time I uh, had my steampunk of Dr. Crusher on. And he was really, really, he, he made the joke from, oh, hey, doc, uh, can you help me with this? And uh, I'm still having that. And I was just saying, okay, I played along with him. And it was <laughs> so, so nice. And, and after that, um, uh, I went for an autograph with him, and he saw me right away. He hooked me right away, and he he welcomed me. Oh, welcome, Doc! Welcome, Doc! You know, <laughs> so yeah. it was really it, it. That was really memorable, and I will never, ever, ever forget that. But it's like I said, it's just the actors also has yes, they have some kind of a stardom, but they are so normal as well right well and that's the thing too with star trek it's a little different because well for instance uh you know this is las vegas where a, it's a casino so there's non-convention people there as well mm -hmm. and we get on the elevator i'm looking down at the ground but my wife blurts out sir it's an honor to be in this elevator with you and i look up and it's dominic keating um Ooh. And I was looking, I'm like, oh my God, how are you doing? And, you know, he was just super nice. Uh, just, you know, exchanged pleasantries. And there was another woman in the elevator, clearly not with the convention. And she says, like, are you famous or something? And, which I thought was a weird way to ask. And he goes, oh, kind of. I was on Star Trek for a little bit uh, and a couple other things. He was very, very humble about it. And I said, uh, he's selling himself short. He was one of the main guys on Star Trek Enterprise. And, and I, then I said, and also the most important tactical officer in Starfleet history. And he just laughed about that. Uh, but I was like yelling. I was kind of yelling that as I'm getting out of the elevator. Um, so, yeah, it's you also have to remember that these people, while they're huge stars to us, maybe not to everyone. Um, you know, and especially something like, you know, Martok, you know, that he was such an important character in DS9 and just this amazing dynamic character. But to most people, like, okay, he was, uh, you know, he was kind of a bit actor on other things. So mm. you kind of have to remember that, like, the actors maybe don't feel like they're stars either until, yeah, I think they forget until they get here and, you know, we start showering them with all this stardom. You know, of course, he is somebody like Patrick Stewart that he's kind of universal, but. Mm. You know, Somebody who was like just on TNG for a little bit, they're not going to get that same level of stardom, which is, I always think it's nice because while the, the celebrities are giving something to us at these conventions, we're also kind of giving them some love they may not, they may not also get all the time. Is there something on a feed that 
is so super different than other conventions? I would say yes, only in the fact that it's different because the fans are different. It's very similar to other sci-fi fantasy cons I've been to where there's a big vendor area, you can get autographs, you can get photo ops, you know, and there you know, there's panels for anything you might want to watch, you know, but it's it you know you have Doctor Who fans, you have Firefly fans, uh, DC uh, and Marvel fans. You mm -hmm. have so many different kind of people, and so many of like the like the Marvel stuff is so popular right now. You're getting people who aren't necessarily, for lack of a better word, huge nerds. You know, and that's fine. I'm not gatekeeping. Come, you know, everybody can come, but. You know, with Star Trek, it's one of those sort of niche things. Um, yeah, I mean, we have some new Star Trek now, but for so many years, there was nothing. And so it was kind of only hardcore Star Trek fans who, as we said earlier, you know, they, they share sort of the same values as far as how they treat people and the future they envision and all that. So the only thing I've noticed that's really different is that at a normal convention, there is a camaraderie and like, hey, we're all nerds. You know, and we all have this in common, but what we, like we said earlier, with a Star Trek convention, you really get that sense that you're all family. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's the key difference that I felt. So, we have talked a little bit about cosplay. What was your first cosplay that you were on, Astolfi? Um, yes. It was actually the night, but so it was the day before it officially opened, when we had early access to the vendor area. Uh, I was wearing my Lower Decks kit. Um, mm -hmm. And that's purely because I thought to myself, okay, Lower Decks came out before, like nothing has, there's been no convention since Lower Decks came out. Mm -hmm. And it would be an opportunity to be one of the first people to ever do Lower Decks at STLV. Um, so I walk in the vendor area and there was one other person and he was actually a vendor. Uh, he was in the same uh, uniform I was in, but he was a captain, I was an ensign. So. He just nodded at me and said, and so, so he just gave me this nod. He's like, you know, as you were ensign, and I just nodded at him and that was it. That was the whole interaction. But I was like, okay, cool. Um, and I don't know uh, if you're really into lower decks, but um, the, the fandom I saw for lower decks was huge. A lot of like custom, custom t-shirts, so many uniforms, so much cosplay. Um, I was just a generic ensign. I didn't dress as a character, but there was some actual character cosplay there, and that was done spectacularly well. Um, but that was the first kit I did. Yeah, it was my, my Lower Decks uniform. Well, what I always have when I put on a Star Trek uniform, I got also something uh, that there was some pride. Yes, to be, yes. Um, there with Starfleet and be in Starfleet and um, what I also uh, really have is and, and I think that's maybe because a little bit of my patriotism because I got a lot of uh, family who wear and are in the military so for me is it something uh, like comparing them with that and that makes sense yeah well but because I always wanted to be in the military, but I can't. Uh, I'm too small. Okay. So uh, that was a little bit disappointing for me. But when I wear a Star Trek uniform, I have that pride. I take that in as, okay, I am that person in uniform and I have that rank, for example. And <laughs> do you have the same feeling? It's so funny you say that, but yes. Um, and it was especially when i put on my just normal like tng seasons three through seven uniform mm. just the i have a basic like science division blue sh blue tunic um and i think on that kit i wear a lieutenant um i don't know why for every kit i wear a different rank for some reason but um so for my TNG kit, I wear Lieutenant, and because I grew up on TNG, and that's my favorite universe, that's yeah. the one. And when I put it on, especially when I do the Picard maneuver and you know pull it down <laughs> to make sure everything's good, the the first time I stood up and did that, I was I look at my wife, I'm like, I feel so cool right now. Yeah. Uh, I know I was totally darking out, and yeah, I 
I found that it my posture was better because I couldn't disrespect the uniform. I was, yeah, it was definitely a pride. I, I had to I had to uphold Starfleet ideals when I was wearing that. So yeah, yeah I definitely I definitely felt it. Yep. Yeah, me too. It's um, yeah, it's also what I think. It's um, if there was be and you said it before. Star Trek is more than only a sci-fi. Uh, series or movies or whatever and um, what I always say is yes Star Trek is sci-fi but it's also future because like for example the Pfizer of Geordi LaForge has already been invented yes absolutely so um, that's what is one of the reason I really love Star Trek and you we as people always can dream bigger than what uh, space really is right now and all the technology in space programs is going better and better and better and uh, yeah I know for a fact that uh, the space programs are always looking back on Star Trek what uh, what they have been invented like that and um, that is one of the things I really, really like about Star Trek. I do too, and sci-fi has always had a really good knack for kind of creating a future that nerds read, and those nerds are creating a future, so it's no it's no accident that they sort of use that as inspiration. Um, kind of a really famous example was uh, Neuromancer, which kind of um, had this idea of the... Uh, it was an early... In, idea of the internet mm -hmm. and of course the people inventing the internet were reading this book and so some of those ideas they was kind of like oh that's good how do we do that and science has definitely been one of those like the idea of a visor i'm sure somebody looked at that and said huh how do you get a sensor tapped into a nerve um uh, for example oh i had a really good example i was working on something once technology related and i even used star trek as an example i cannot remember what it was um but yeah there's so many good ideas that come from sci-fi um and so i think that's sort of an unintended side effect my favorite thing that sci-fi does is it just lets you tell a story without any prejudice so you can tell a story about race in America right now, but because you're talking about Andorians 400 years from now, people don't have those same prejudices reading that story. Um, and I, I only found out several months ago that that's why Gene Roddenberry invented Star Trek. He was trying to do complicated social issues on a cop show that yes. he was working on and so because he couldn't do it there he said fine i'll do a sci-fi show and you people won't even know i'm telling social stories um and so yeah i mean the roots of star trek were that and i didn't even i thought it was sci-fi first with great social stuff you know kind of just as a bonus but no it was it was a it was a social show first with sci-fi as a bonus um yeah which i think is fantastic well, that's what I really love about Gene Wallenberry is that he had a vision that, um, and you can see that with all the problems there was in, uh, at the time, like uh, racism and uh, all that kind of stuff. And he was the one who, and especially in uh, the original series, he put those life lessons into those episodes. Yeah. And, uh, for example, also the first um, racial kiss of uh, Uhura and Kirk. Correct. And he was the one who put Uhura, a black woman, and an Asian man into his um, show without being them like a slave or something else. So right, exactly. it was equal them in rights. And that's what I really love about Gene Roddenberry. He had a great vision and he's a great visionary on a lot of social um, projects and what, what, uh, what's going on in the world right now. But for example, too, I don't know. Do you remember that episode in Deep Space Nine that 
they went back to the earth and there was so much poverty oh. and um, yes. Cisco was so angry and he was so in the moment and I really love that one too it's just um, I do think there are some very historical moments that be enlightened in Star Trek yeah, I agree. And, you know, I I, I know uh, the UK is not without its issues, but America, of course, is, I mean, we're one, you know, 300-year-old racial problem, really. Um, so we have so many social issues here just from our founding. And so Star Trek really, really, it's, it's so, like, some of those old issues are unfortunately still so relevant now. Mm -hmm. um, but, no, the, his sheer genius, and the, I... When you think about when Star Trek came out, um, you know he had a he had a Russian on the bridge during the Cold War. He had a Japanese person on the bridge. Not even twenty years after the Second World War ended, like World War Two was still very fresh in people's minds mm -hmm. when that show was on. And of course, you know having a you know a, a woman of color on board um, in a in an important commanding scientific role that was so huge, but. You know, it was the time that he was doing. And of course, that was having during the civil rights struggles. So he was treating these like, oh, this is a normal thing to have happened. But in Earth at the time, it was anything but. So, uh, yeah, I. Again, as somebody who sees his own country having these problems over and over, it's very. It's very nice to know that these lessons are still there for people to learn. And, you know, maybe somebody can still learn from, you know, a 50 year old episode of Star Trek. Well, I must say, uh, how weird it all sounds, I do like those episodes. It's not of uh, the history behind it, but it is also, yeah, they, they go, it's, I do, don't like the time traveling, but it is some kind of like, for example, when that episode in uh, also, uh, I thought it was the hero gens in... Or no, 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 no. That was, oh, what was it? It was with Ford that the, he was some kind of a nuclear scientist for uh, the German. Crew of the Voyager was in kind of a kidnapped. And uh, there was a crew that uh, was building everything up uh, in the ship itself. But the whole story was, uh, for example, in uh, the hollow deck. They made a holodeck version of um, the World War II and that uh, Fosk was uh, this uh, nuclear uh, scientist and uh, I thought, yeah, that was Chakotay and Paris were one of the, uh, those American soldiers. I don't think I've seen that one. I, to my great shame, uh, I have not finished Voyager. That's okay. the one show I've not seen. I, and we're about halfway through. Uh, my excuse is when it was on the that's air. that's okay. Where I lived at the time did not get that network. And so mm. it was like years later when I could finally start watching it. And just I just never got around to it. I only finished Deep Space Nine a couple of years ago. So, um, but yeah, so I'm still still working through Voyager, unfortunately. Okay, well, fortunately, I mean, there's still new, there's still new Star Trek for me, so it's actually not bad for me. But yeah, I, it's I know I, I should have seen it by now. But it's fine. I just uh, uh, it's. But I had that with Deep Space Nine too. When it aired, I couldn't get it around it because it was so dark. And I know, yeah. When now they are, uh, when they Netflix put it on. I rewatched it again, and now I could understand, you know. And it was very funny to see some characters back, like uh, Miles O'Brien and uh, yeah, Worf, and how. And that's what I really do love about Deep Space Nine. It's more about the people instead of the technology. Yes, absolutely. And I, you know, I heard this all the time. Oh, it's, it, I don't want to watch that show. What fun is a space station? You know, Star Trek's about going out and doing things. And I, you know, and when I was a kid, I actually did try watching it. And I was, well, I think we're about the same age. So, yeah, I mean, you know how old that was. And, yeah, I was coming from next gen. I was like, this is so boring. Yeah, Just, I had to do. 
and then I watch it as an adult. And you know, people ask me what's the what my favorite Star Trek series is, and I always say the best Star Trek was Deep Space Nine. My favorite is still Next Gen because um, mm -hmm. I think the writing on Deep Space Nine was still the best of any series ever. Yeah, yeah. I really agree to that, yeah. And I do think it's just, it's in a way totally different than the other tracks. And it but is. I also, I had that the same with Discovery. I had to watch Discovery for about two, three times before I could say, okay, now I can see it. And yes. there was one of the actors who told the fans, Guys, I know a lot of you don't like it because it is not a track like uh, the original Cirque and TNG or Voyager. But you have to bear in mind Star Trek is changing as well. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, yeah. Yeah, and new shows. I mean, that's how we bring in new blood. I mean, the. So, I mean, I, I'm a huge Star Trek fan, but some of the original series episodes, I they're hard to watch just because they're very old. They were filmed in a <laughs> yeah. different style. And so, like, I can watch Next Gen because it doesn't seem old to me because I grew up with it. But, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's 30 years old now. I get it. If you're a teenager now, that just looks like an old TV show. Whereas Discovery, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Discovery looks like it, it's fun and exciting. You know, you have yeah. to keep up. Well, I do think it's totally different star trek because yes in tng you had moments of action but it also was a science ship so yeah. there were other kind of adventures and if we are talking about the youth from uh, of this time although star trek next gen is old i think a lot of young people can also identify themselves with for example wesley Yes. And so it, it's never gonna grow old. And with the new Star Trek, yeah, like you said, sometimes it's very, very uh, fast. And I really have that with Lower Decks. Uh, I still don't know what I think about Lower Decks, but I said to my uh, fiance, I will give it a try because I know. Uh, the season two will be having a lot more uh, other actors we know and other characters that are coming back. So I'm yeah. looking forward to it. But yeah, I need to watch an episode four or five times before I actually can say, oh, okay, yeah, now I understand. And also the humor, uh, because English is not my first language, I have some problem with that. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, we well, you know, English is my first language. And uh, my wife and I actually had our own Star Trek podcast a couple of years ago um, that I don't know, you know, you know, projects is sort of fizzle out. But um, and we were doing discovery um, reviews. Ah, or yeah. Apps. yeah. Uh, well, when it when it was on, when it wasn't on, we were picking other topics. But so we started out, we would watch it with notes and try to do an episode right after because we wanted to get them out quick. Yeah. Instead, what we decided to do was actually enjoy the show, watch it with no notes, just watch it like we're fans. And then we would watch it with notes two times. Yeah. yeah. And, and we found our episodes got so much better just because you, you yeah. there's so much in those episodes to unpack. You really do have to watch it multiple times. Yeah, I did the same. I uh, did the reviews also after that. The, I had, didn't have a podcast yet, but um, yeah, it's just, yeah, what you say, if you watch it two or three times, then then you see other things as well, yeah. especially the Easter eggs. I didn't know before what Easter eggs were, but <laughs> a friend of mine explained it to me last week, so now I know. Okay, nice. Yeah, no, I... Yeah, now that you mention it, that phrase makes no sense unless you, uh, like, yeah. Like, that's a very, like, you had to have grown up with English as a native language for that to make any sense. Uh, that's it. Yeah, that's funny that you, now that you say that. But um, so Lower Decks is especially like that, where 
because it is sort of a parody and a tribute at the same time, mm -hmm. it is non-stop Easter eggs. And yeah. we've seen the first season probably five times through now. Um, well, it was, you know, we were... We finally, so the first time I watched it, I was like, okay, maybe it's good. Mm -hmm. Second and third time, I was like, I'm kind of getting it. And it was like the fourth time I was like, okay, this is amazing and I love it. Um, you know, Star Trek can be so serious, it's almost hard to have a yeah. good time with it. It's almost hard to like joke about it without feeling like, are we making fun of this? Are we not respecting it? But the way that I, it helped me to think about it was it's not a, it's not making fun of Star Trek. Think of it as a comedy that is airing in the Star Trek universe. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that made it easier to kind of appreciate. And the uh, the Easter eggs and just the, the density of references they put into that show. Um, I'm sure I haven't caught everything even after, you know, four or five times. And I've only seen the new episode of season two once. So I'm sure I have to watch that about eight more times before next week. But um, yeah, I know you're absolutely right. You, they, they the new shows especially are so, so packed. You you can't appreciate them with just one viewing. So if we are going back to the SDLV, what is your favorite part of it? And that will be my last question. <laughs> okay, uh, my absolute favorite part, it's probably those little moments that you get with the, the stars when you know, I probably my talk with Chirac Lofton um, mm. was the probably the highlight. So actually, that led to my absolute my absolute highlight for the entire trip. So I had this great conversation with him, and the next day I'm walking through one of the hallways towards the uh, towards the convention, and somebody is coming up to me and they are waving at me. And I don't know who it is. I don't recognize this person. And it takes me a second, and I realize, like, oh, that's Chirac Lofton who's waving at me and clearly recognizes me. So the takeaway was that Jake Sisko recognized me before I recognized him. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> to yeah. be fair, though, so the other part of that story that makes it make sense was he was wearing a hat, sunglasses, and a mask, and I have blue hair, so I'm pretty easy to spot. So uh, <laughs> it's not that amazing. It was actually pretty reasonable, but, you know, if you leave out those details, it makes me sound a lot cooler than I am. Um, <laughs> and then and then he, yeah, a couple of times later throughout the week, he was just kind of like, hey, man, what's up? Just when I would pass him in the hallway, and I was like, that's so weird that, like, he remembers me from a conversation two days ago and is kind of just you know, acting like, you know, like you wouldn't treat anybody you had a pleasant conversation with. You know, you would say hi to him when you pass. Um, and again, you know, he's a regular person. He's not, you know, he's nothing special really, but to, to have that kind of like, just that connection with a show that has meant so much to you and with a character that had meant so much, you know, I spent many years being raised by a single father too. So there was a lot of Jake Sisko's story kind of meant a lot to me. Um, and um, yeah, so to have that connection and have, basically the fan kind of care or the 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 actor care about the fans as much as the fans care about the actors to me that's kind of the, the coolest part well i do think it's uh also in the way of he just shared with you also something personally very much so yeah and i appreciated that so much i mean he he, you know, he did not have to do that i and you know i i would not have shared with a perfect stranger i'll tell you that much so i was uh i was I appreciated it and you know it did not go unnoticed by me well i do think also because it was um because you were just quote private with him and i do think that uh, some of the people um like well they share a story with you because they want to share and of course, this is also some kind of a little legacy he left behind. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, him sharing uh, his stories about uh, his friend, you know, that, who was also dear. You know, uh, Eric, you know, we saw Aaron Eisenberg in 2019, and he was so full of life. He was talking about yeah. these projects he was working on, and then it was not long after he passed away. And we, you know, when we shared that with Chirac, and he's like, yeah, I was he was actually at that convention not as a guest but just working at aaron's booth hang just hanging out with his friend basically mm -hmm. and 
so you know we kind of shared our stories of that last convention and you know it was I don't know, we both had a little bit, but he, of course, being close friends with him, he had a lot more to share. So, yeah, it was just, it was two people randomly meeting, sharing their memories of uh, somebody who touched their lives, obviously in different ways. But, yeah, I'm sure that was in somewhat therapeutic for him, but in another way, it was, you know, helping to spread this legacy of his friend who's gone. Yeah, and that's also the, uh, the nice part of it. I don't know uh, if you know it, but uh, I myself play Star Trek Online. Oh, do you? Okay, cool. I have my own fleet, so um, thanks to my fiancé, because I always ask her, well, I'm not a gamer, I'm not a gamer, and he put me into the game of Star Trek Online, my first RPG game, uh, two years later, and I'm addicted to it. <laughs> okay, um, I have played. I actually pre-ordered it when it launched in 2010, I think. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, my... But... I have since lost that account, and I actually, it's funny, this morning I downloaded it again, uh, because oh! um, I can't remember the name of the group, it's like Strike Force Armada, maybe? Uh, mm. But there was, a, there was a Star Trek Online fleet there, and they also write, like, guidebooks, uh, physical mm. books you can buy on Amazon and stuff like that, so uh, they were talking about it a lot, I'm like, you know, I haven't played that game in forever, I'm gonna go check it out again, so, yeah, um, when I get off work today, my plan is to hop in and try that out. So uh, well, I might I'm be a... looking for a fleet. So I'll uh, if I if I stick with it, I'll I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> oh yeah, that's super great. Um, but what I want to say is that there are a lot of uh, actors who have done the voiceovers for those characters and those uh, video moments in Star Trek Online, and I'm so glad that Aaron. Uh, did that with also yes. uh, the one who played Odo and Kira Renees, uh, everyone who really have been, and that's the, um, I will give you the link about of that. There is a new videos part of um, one of the latest episodes, and that is that uh, we are going to fight against the Borg Queen. Oh, nice. And, oh, <laughs> Do you mind if I can spoil something for you? Before uh, you ahead. watch shit? Okay. The point is they come back uh, in space, uh, you're on your bridge, and the queen is saying, yeah, you think you're tough, but I got uh, more uh, tougher friends, etc, etc, etc. And at the very latest moment, the alliances of Starfleet come in, and you may cry your heart out now because all the famous captains are coming with their ships and oh. they say something and the first time i saw that i was screaming of happiness and that is just the so legacy of it and even to for example here janeway say let's assimilate something of our own for example mm, right no i yeah especially when you're not expecting that like just and you're part of it too like you're on that mission and, yeah 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 it really does pull you in and it was it, that are like i said those are the things that they uh, immortalize now their legacy in this game and I hope that a lot more of actors are going to do that. Um, my tip, go just play it and have fun. And I will uh, send you that link of my, uh, that little video to you so you can watch it on my YouTube. Okay, um, great. It's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Like Picard, Cisco, um... What was the other one? Uh, Jonathan Archer, name it. Uh, okay. Even um, even Nock has his own uh, ship. Oh, cool! Like that so it's it's it was really a part that I was saying yes. That's the legacy they left behind, and especially Nock and 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 Odo. They have passed away uh, not long ago, and right. If you play the um, episode timeline, then yeah, it's phenomenal and great, and uh, I really enjoy doing that. Oh, 
Okay, well, um, yeah, you've definitely uh, sold me on getting back into it. So. <laughs> well, if you like, and uh, if you want to gear up, uh, you know where to find me. So, um, yeah, um, it's it's nice to talk about Star Trek Radio. Yeah, really definitely. It's been so fun. I really enjoyed it. So, um, I will come back with you X uh, times with, I'm doing another Star Trek episode, join me. Okay, that sounds great. I'd, I'd love to be on again. So, um, thank you for being my guest today. And, you know, who knows, we talk again in another episode. I, I would like that very much. Yes, thanks for having me on. This has been so much fun. If you like this podcast, you can like and subscribe on all the platforms. You can also follow and comment on Podbean, Spotify and Google Podcast. On social media, the Facebook group, the Discord server and YouTube channel of Orenda Talks Fantasy and Sci-Fi. And on Twitter at OTFASP. Let me know what you think of this episode. In the next episode, we will talk about X-Files. I'm Orinda, and thank you for listening to Orinda Talks Fantasy and Sci-Fi. See you next time.